First of all, I really am honored to be here today. I hope the mic is working well, if you can hear me okay. And uh, yes, thank you for indicating that. You can never tell with these remote things. Uh, my name is Woody Zool, and I'm a software developer, and I've been working with software for about 40 years. Today, I'm going to talk about a topic that is extremely important to me, that I learned many, many years ago, but I think that I only recently have understood how important what I'm going to share with you is. Now, we only have a small amount of time, so I'm going to move right into it. I always start uh, every talk, practically, that I give. I start by sharing this concept that... The value of another's experience is to give us hope, not to tell us how or whether to proceed. So it's not my intention to tell you what you should do or how you should go about doing things. I'm just gonna offer you uh, some of my experiences and talk about some of my ideas, hoping that it'll be some kind of a use for you. I hope it's interesting to you. So um, try to keep an open mind. Don't accept anything I tell you as being true or not true. Just uh, let it let it flow. Maybe later some of this will, you know, come back to you and you'll find it useful. So I'm going to talk about me as a child. When I was about 13 years old, I took my first job, and it was watering plants at a plant nursery. And this was a I was very interested in in horticulture and that sort of stuff, and it was a a wonderful job for me. But uh, my job my boss took me aside on the first day. He was about I think he was about 55 years old, so he was quite a bit. Uh, you know, I was very much his junior, but he treated me as if I was an adult. He told me I have two responsibilities. The main one is to water the plants, not only keep them alive, but give them an environment where they can thrive. And he said, that means you're going to need to learn a lot about all these different kinds of plants because each one has a different need for water. And certainly they can't just stand up and walk over to a place where they can get a drink. We have to bring the water to them. Well, that was important. So he was telling me my job is important. These plants will die without me. But he also told me there's a second uh, responsibility, and that is to pay attention and each week find something that we can do better and then take action on it. And the action usually, at least the way he was mentioning it, I would come to him at the end of the week, share with him the idea that I found that we need to improve, and then we talk about options on ways to improve it. So I think uh, that was an, also an important thing, maybe more important than my job of watering the plants. The thing is, is that essentially he understood a very important concept, that tiny improvements over time provide a compounding effect. What this means is that if you can make improvements that stick, and each day you make a little bit more of an improvement, you'll get an amazing return over time. Now, if we could get only a 1% improvement per day over a year, the results is 37.78 times whatever our abilities were before. That's a huge improvement. That's, a, that's a astounding to me. Well, I put that into a, a spreadsheet to verify for myself that this, this numbering is correct, and it turns out it is. So uh, if we're compounding daily, now that might be impossible to do, but the basic concept is sound. Whatever compounding period we have, let's have this tiny improvements happen. So essentially, uh, unfortunately, it's just not as simple as it seems. This is actually very difficult to achieve. I'd kind of like it where I could just say, hey, that's it. I'm done uh, with this talk. Just go and do, whoops, I'm sorry. Just go ahead and do what I just mentioned. What I'm going to do right now, though, is let's explore why it is so hard to make these tiny improvements. Matter of fact, uh, this also lends to why things are so hard to manage. Essentially, okay. There's a bunch of things that make our work difficult. I like to do this as an exercise. We're not gonna have time to do that here today, but I like to ask this question when I'm doing a workshop. What gets in the way of us effectively getting our work done? And when we do this as a, as a workshop, we usually find that we're gonna get some large number of little things that get in our way. This was a group of 20 people, and in uh, three minutes, they came up with all these different problems. These are things that can destroy effectiveness, like um, needless meetings, distractions, disagreements, uh, context switching, um, uh, let's see, uh, waiting on dependencies, 
uh, lack of a work backlog, a monolithic architecture. If we're doing software, uh, one of the things that gets in our way is these technical blockers and uh, legacy code that's hard to work on. Well, after doing this exercise and, uh, many times, I think I've done this maybe a thousand times with different groups, what have we learned? And this is what I've learned. There are many problems. They're kind of the same everywhere, but they're very persistent. If I go to a company and then come back five years later and ask them what problems they're having, it's often the same list. And again, they're everywhere. So I want to ask ourselves, why are there so many and why are they so persistent? And why are they so pervasive? Here's the thing. If we're trying to solve these problems and yet we still have them five years later, um, what's going wrong? So here's what I want to talk about. I, I originally noticed this in 1999 at a company I worked at. We would do our work. This was before Agile was even a term. And uh, then we would have a lessons learned. And in the first lessons learned, we noticed some problems. These are the ones that seem most important to me. I'm not going to read them off because that's not really relevant. What's relevant is we decided how we would go about fixing them and attempted to fix these problems and then go back and do our uh, next bit of work. These were six-week iterations. So at the end of six weeks, we would do this exercise of determining what was wrong. And off we are doing our work. We come to our next uh, six weeks. And again, we have the same problems. Why are we having all these same problems? And this just goes on and on. We've set out to solve the problems, but we're not solving them. So what has happened here? Matter of fact, this is really um, not as difficult as you might think. I, I think even then, uh, 20 years ago, I understood this is about the cycle of continuous no improvements. We are attempting, we should have a cycle of continuous improvement. But here we have a cycle of continuous no improvements. We should be able to recognize that and talk to ourselves about that. What's causing that? And this brings us to problems or symptoms and then the rest of the talk. So I think these are all symptoms. All the things that we will write down and say, here's a problem we're having that's making it difficult for us to work. I think they're symptoms and we can't solve for symptoms. Symptoms are not something you can solve. They're just an indication of a problem that you might want to address. And so can you uh, solve for a symptom? You can't. For example, if I have a cold and I'm coughing and, I have a, and I'm congested, well, I can take a cough suppressant and I can take a decongestant. I'm not curing whatever it is that's causing those symptoms. I'm just addressing the symptoms. Not necessarily a useful thing to do. At best, we're hiding the problem. Now I feel better because I've, I'm no longer congested. I took some aspirin too. I'm feeling great. I go for a walk and now I'm wearing out myself when my body really shouldn't be taking on all these activities. We hid the problem and we're not really addressing the problem. So, but I think we have a bigger conundrum. And this is, uh, this is a, a, a much bigger problem. Can we solve problems? So we can't solve for symptoms, but can we solve problems? I've watched this over and over. Even when people get to what they think is the problem, that doesn't really solve anything. Or maybe we all often see that, that today's solution to a problem just becomes tomorrow's problem. So what are we gonna do about this? Things are hard to manage because we're focusing on solving problems. I wanna talk about this just for a minute because I think this is the misplaced focus of management. Management is often focused on solving problems. That's what they're there for and that's what they do. And they think that that's what our whole company is supposed to be doing. One big problem is that it's hard to manage things and we think we need to solve for that. Now this is kind of trouble, a troubling thing to me because Essentially, we've introduced the same uh, issue where we're dealing with the symptom and not the problem itself. So we think we need to manage, make things easier to manage. A management that's having trouble managing things wants to make it easier to manage. This, I think, is the misplaced focus of management. I like this saying from Peter Drucker. He's a famous uh, uh, management guru, wrote a lot of books in the past. Uh, so much of what we call management consists in making it difficult for people to work. So when we make it easier to manage things, we're actually making it harder for the people we're managing to get their work done. It's a vicious cycle. Things just keep getting worse and worse and worse. So why do we let this happen? Well, that's going to cover a lot of things now. Uh, first of all, beliefs 
get in our way and the, our biases make it even worse. So let's see how these things work for us. I'm gonna share this stuff from a book by David Gray, Liminal Thinking. Uh, this comes from his book. Uh, basically he talks about, or this, what he's talking about here is that we have uh, the unknowable, reality, everything around us, everything in the universe. We can't know all of that, but we do have experiences. And when we have experiences, we get revealed things to us. If we walk down the street, uh, we work on a project, uh, we're learning to play a musical instrument, we have experiences. And that seems like a nice thing to build our beliefs on. But what happens is we can only pay attention to a very little bit of stuff. And upon this little bit of stuff that we let into our brains and that it gets stuck in our brains, we can build our theories, which we can then make judgments about, which leads to our beliefs. At the very top of this is this space where we think these things are obvious. This is the obvious stuff, but in reality, it's not. Um, our, our beliefs are built on these powerful tools of theories, judgments, and yet it's based on a tiny little bit of attention that we've paid to things. If you take two people who grew up together, spent most of their childhoods together, uh, went to school together, and then they're in their later years, they had the same experiences maybe, but they were paying attention to different little parts of it. This is a problem. Things are hard to manage because what we believe is based on this little thin thread. We can't know what reality is. It's really tough to, to have useful beliefs, but we need to have beliefs. Beliefs are necessary. If we didn't have beliefs, then it would take too long to make de decisions about anything. So we have the beliefs. The problem is they can limit us. So what I wanna share now is the idea of biases. So biases are just a very powerful, um, I don't know what's the right word, it's a condition every human has. And these biases allow us to make decisions quickly as well. This is a, uh, a pretty interesting diagram you can find on uh, Wikipedia, uh, I believe. And uh, it's very, it collects together a whole bunch of different biases and categorizes them and subcategorizes them so you can compare them and learn about them. I'm only gonna talk about really one of those today and that's confirmation bias. I would bet that there's other people at this conference who are also speaking about it. It was certainly popular in the last few years to talk about confirmation bias, but this is one that we really need to pay attention to. Um, maybe we need to pay attention to all of them, but. When we have confirmation bias, what we're trying to do is, is we've already kind of believed something or have something we want to believe. And so our biases guide us to strengthening that belief. So we're gonna have a biased search for information. When we search for information, we're looking for the information that confirms what we already want to believe. We're gonna interpret it in a way that satisfies that desire. You give two, uh, papers to two people with opposing opinions to read that are about their opinion, about the topic of their opinion, and they read them, they'll both find things in those papers that support their own point of view. And this is the biased interpretation. And then we have a biased memory. Memories are constructed. They're, they don't stay with us like we think they do. Uh, we construct them over and over again, and we change them to fit the narrative that we want to have. So here we go. This is confirmation bias. Well, things are hard to manage because it's human nature to believe what we already or what we want to believe, right or wrong. It's human nature to do that. I'm going to give you a quick example. One of the beliefs that a lot of people has is that, hey, we succeeded and we actually celebrate this because we're so brilliant or we made the right decisions or we read the right books or we went to the right school or whatever it is. We believe we succeeded because the actions we took. Now, this book from Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, many of you have read it. I like this little thing that he says about success. Success is talent plus luck. We all have some talent. We all get some luck. Great success is equal to a little more talent and a lot more luck. In other words, it's about, did everything go the way we needed it to go? Is that what got us to where we are? So things are hard to manage because success is more about this randomness than anything else. So we think we're taking the right steps and we wanna do that same thing over again, but it doesn't really work out that way. We, we want to believe that we succeeded because we did things right. 
Now, I have to be very careful with this one myself. Here I am telling you about stuff. That's why I was careful at the beginning to tell you, I'm not telling you the truth. I'm telling you some of the things I think about that might be true. Okay, so I wanna talk about systems and domains. Boy, I'm covering a lot here. Uh, a quick definition of system. A system is an interconnected and interacting set of elements that achieve something. Now that's just one way to define this. But I wanna talk about the different levels of systems. We have the work itself that we're doing. And outside of that, or with, it's gonna be within a system that's outside of it, that is the system of work. It could be defined or not defined. For example, we're gonna make a sandwich. In the, in the defined area, those are the actual steps we take or the, the system of work, those are the steps we take to make the sandwich, not necessarily that we've written it out. Okay, outside of that might be a system of management. If we're doing this in a business, then we're going to have the scheduling and the organizing, the hiring and the planning, and what is it we're going to work on is all decided out here. And then another layer is maybe the system of purpose. Why do we have this business? Why are we making sandwiches and things like that? Now, don't take this graph as meaning too much more than we have these systems within systems within systems. This is what's important to me about that. If we see the symptoms of something inside, it's impossible usually to fix that from inside. We have to move to the system that's outside of it or even outside of that or outside of that. So whatever system we're working within or we see the problem, we have to step back and out of that system to be able to make the changes that we want to make. So if there's symptoms here, maybe there's symptoms here, it's going to grow and grow and grow. We never really know if we're dealing on symptoms or a problem, but hopefully we can at least see uh, that we can't solve the problem where the symptoms first show up. So things are hard to manage because we rarely consider what level the problem is located or at what level it can be addressed. Now, of course, this is going to go a little bit further. Things aren't as isolated as we think they are. So we want to think we've got this place we're working. We can figure it all out. We have these systems. We know our purpose and we've learned how to manage. But there's so many things to interfere with us. Essentially, here's our clean little world we'd want it to be. But here's what the world is really like. All around us is all other symptom uh, systems uh, going on at the same time. This, and they could contain our, our systems or they can be outside of our uh, system or they could be overlapping us. But they'll affect us in many, many different ways. A good example right now is, you know, a year ago, I wouldn't be trying to figure out when can I travel again. But right now, you know, the system that's outside of my system of work is telling me, hey, you can't travel right now. That's just the way it is. So these things are also interfering. So I want to tell just a little bit more about the nature of, of systems. This is critical to me. This is really an important slide. A work, I'm going to read it word for word. A working complex system has invariably evolved from a working simple system. That means we have to have a working simple system to evolve into our working complex system, which most businesses are. We can't invent these systems. Let's go a couple more things about the nature of systems. I'm gonna read them again. An important function of almost every system is to ensure its own perpetuation. If a system has waited around or been around long enough to be the way we're running our company, then we need to, it, it, its main feature, its main function is that it's learned to keep, to stay around. It's learned to perpetuate itself. It's learned to keep itself alive. The last thing is also from Danella Meadows here, the idea of making a complex system do just what we want it to can, it be, cheap, can be achieved only temporarily at best. Wow, if that's true, and I think these things are, have a good chance of being true, um, that means whatever we do to try to change the system we're in to make, uh, to make work, you know, make it better or do whatever, um, we're tricking ourselves. You put these three things together and we're really in a mess. What are we going to do about that? We'll talk about a little bit later. Things are hard to manage because the system is good at perpetuating itself. It does this by evolving. It does its own changes. It doesn't, it, when we introduce a change, we're, we're just giving it something that it's going to need to evolve around. It's very rare that we, that the system will change in the way we want it to. It's not going to happen by intervention. It's not going to happen by transformation. It's going to happen. It's not going to change the way we like. It's going to happen because it evolved outside of our control. I'm going to consider Kinevin only for a moment here. 
Uh, you've probably have all heard about Kinevin. If you haven't, you can look it up. You probably have had even uh, seen talks by Dave Snowden, the fellow who put this together. I'm just going to show this chart for a moment. There are more than four uh, domains shown here. They're not quadrants, although that kind of looks like quadrants. And some of these overlap in different ways. Uh, there's a fifth one uh, that's, that's not as clear, but I'm going to say them real quick. We have the clear, the complicated, the complex, and the chaotic. Now, I'm going to go through uh, uh, just a tiny little bit of uh, uh, to make this easier for you to understand. If you're a newcomer to this, it's not perfect. I'm working on this still. But just understand this. Things in each one of these domains have to be dealt with in different ways. You approach the problems, you approach the situation in different ways. In the clear state, you know what you're doing, follow the instructions. There's nothing difficult. In the complicated state, we need to analyze things. We need to really pay attention, but we can figure these things out usually. But in the complex state, we can't analyze and come up with a result. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but think of it this way. In the clear state, A plus B or A times B or input A and B, you always get the same result. In the complicated space, you input A and B, you're gonna get a different result every time because you're gonna need to make a lot of decisions on, on things, but the range of the difference isn't that much. You move into the complex space, input A and B, and you're gonna get a different result every time, not predictable at all. Chaotic space is just an emergency is happening. At least that's the way I'm going to share it here. In the middle there is the, we don't know what our, what our uh, domain is, so we have to figure that out first. So I'm going to tell it this way. In the U.S., in the United States, we have something like this. It's, a, it's biscuits in a can. You can open them up, put them on a pan, put them in the oven, follow the instructions, and you get the same good biscuits every time. They're not the greatest biscuits in the world, and a biscuit or a little roll or whatever you want to call it, but there you go. But if you want to have um, a little bit better thing, like a bakery quality, quality biscuit, like a delicious croissant that's flaky and really wonderful, then that moves us into the complicated domain because the person doing the work has to take into consideration a lot of the details. Like, is this oven exactly the same as that oven? Each one heats a little differently. It's more humid today than it was yesterday. The quality of the butter we're using today isn't as good as yesterday. Or the quality of the, of the flour is a little bit better today or whatever. They're paying attention to all those details. But it's not, it's not, it's not simple, but it's not really that difficult. But, and there are known unknowns. That's the main thing I wanna think about here. When we move into the complicated space, and as I was, or the complex space, uh, as I was uh, thinking about this, I wanted to come up with something related with food on this, and this is called molecular gastronomy. With molecular gastronomy, you're trying to invent new foods. You're trying to invent new combinations of the ingredients and new combinations of the ways you can affect those ingredients and combine them. It's a process of discovery, and there are many unknown Un unknowns. These are the unknown unknowns where, what if we add this to that? What will happen? We don't know yet. We know enough about the chemistry and physics of creating food, but we're explorers. We're going to discover as we go. The last one is chaotic. With chaotic, you just need to take action. You put the biscuits in the oven, uh, they caught on fire. It was too hot or whatever. What are you going to do? Well, you're not going to sit and think about it or whatever. You're just going to put the fire out and then try and recoup. In this case, here we've got the biscuits. Um, you know, is my family going to be okay with this? Can I just peel off the bad part and hand it to them? I can ask them, is this okay? You know, I can now assess. I made a mistake, but how do we solve it? But when we're in the middle of the emergency, we just need to take care of the emergency. Hopefully that's not too far out of the intent of Kinevin, but there we go. So, this is the thing, the tactics and techniques we use in each one of these domains is gonna vary from do uh, by domain to do domain. So things are hard to manage because we don't often even understand there are domains and we don't know the domain of the problem. And even more, that we don't necessarily use the techniques suitable for the domain that we're in. I'm gonna skip ahead just a little bit because I wanna give you a few practical things before we're done. So I'm gonna review where we're at. Let's have this tiny improvements habit. We get a big value from that. There are many things that get in our way and we talked about problems versus symptoms. We talked about the wrong focus of management, usually. We talked about our beliefs and our biases. 
Is it luck or is it talent? And finally, systems and domains. So I wanna give a few practical things. Uh, this isn't much, I don't have a lot of help for you. I think we need as a world, as, as people, we need to find the solutions to these things. But first of all, I'm gonna talk about working harder, I mean, working smarter. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about make it easy. And then I'm gonna talk about the bubble. So I think we have enough time to do this. Uh, working smarter versus working harder. When I first heard about this, I didn't really understand what it meant. It was finally explained to me. This was many, many years ago, about 20 years ago, though I came upon this paper, which you can find and download for free on the internet. Uh, nobody ever gets credit for fixing problems that never happened. This is a paper about creating, sustaining a process improvement. And essentially they give a graph, I've rearranged it a little bit here, but, but your actual performance is gonna be your effort times your capability. If you, need to, if you don't have much capability, you need to put in a lot of effort. But if you have a lot of capability, a lot less effort gets you the results you want. What happens over time is if we need to work harder, we're going to become less and less capable because we have less and less time to focus on making those tiny improvements. And what they're really ex explaining in this book is that at first, or in this paper, at first, if you try to, uh, when you work harder, you'll get more productivity. But then that drops off as you work, have to work harder and harder because you're not improving your capability. When you try to improve your capability, it's going to drop down a little bit for a while. And people will say, oh, no, we got to get back to work because this isn't paying off right now. So they're looking at the short term. To really get advantage of this, it's a long-term thing. It's the tiny improvements compounding over time. They actually suggest we should be spending more of our time increasing capability than in actually doing the work. And I think that pays off. Uh, I've experimented with it enough to, to think that that pays off. Okay, that's just back to the first couple slides. Let's have this tiny improvements habit. But now I wanna talk about making it easy and the misplaced focus of management. What can we do about this? Well, I don't have a big uh, solution, uh, but managers, let's stop thinking about how to make things easy to manage. For example, if you are saying, oh, we got to cut costs because uh, we're not going to be able to make our budget. We're running out of money. If we cut costs, we will usually interfere with our ability to get the work done that is going to make us money. So instead, what we would want to do is make it easy for us to get the work done, and then we will get the benefit of lower costs. That's sort of the what we're trying to do. So remember this quote from earlier, most management is just putting impediments in place or destroying our, our ability to be effective. What can we do again? instead? I'm just saying we got to change our point of view. Those, those of us who are involved in management stuff nowadays, particularly, let's make it as easy as possible for everyone to do the best they can possibly do. That would take a whole nother talk to do. So we're going to skip ahead. Let's talk about systems and domains. How do we deal with this? I have practical experience with this. I think this is a valid thing. I want to talk about how do we deal with the system that we really can't change? What are we going to do? And I got this um, slide I'm going to show you from Michael Sahota. He's a trainer in uh, you know, the, the uh, Certified Agile Leadership uh, Program in Scrum. Uh, at least that's what he was doing when I last uh, checked on that. Uh, he's a longtime Scrum, uh, scrum uh, person, and he, I really love his stuff. I read a lot of his, any article he writes, I try to read. He has this diagram that I saw uh, way back uh, six, seven years ago, and it described for me what I was trying to do uh, in the place I was working. I was trying to make it where we had this isolated team that could we could keep from being affected by the rest of the organization. So if you think of it this way, here I have a little system and this system is just this team and I want to make it where it's, uh, not being, it's not being interfered with by the rest of the organization, but this is hard to do. And in this diagram, I don't know if this is gonna work. Let's see, we have this, this kind of a bubble that we're in and there's adapters and other stuff that's allowing us to operate within some little area without the rest of the organization caring about it or knowing about it. That's the bubble. And if we can have that, then the rest of the system isn't gonna to try to close us down. My hope was if we could do this, we would grow that bubble into more of the department. And eventually the whole department would be within that bubble and they would be having such good uh, success that other parts of the company 
uh, would be paying attention to it and noticing it and trying to create their own bubbles. So to draw the, the end of this, essentially, if those grow, maybe they can kind of skeletonize the original organization. Now, I have taken it this far, but that, that we could eventually, the new system, which grew up out of a simple uh, system, will overcome or overwhelm the outer system. Now, I don't know that that can really happen. It's just an idea. But this is a thing. We could introduce the chance for small systems to start and then to evolve. And to do that, we need to we need to have a protected area. So that kind of covers most of what I want to cover today. The object isn't to make art. It's to be in that wonderful state which makes art inevitable. In other words, don't set out to do great things. Set out to prepare an environment where great things will just naturally happen. And I think that's worth considering. Well, that's the end of this talk. I think we have some time for some questions. Uh, I can't even pronounce this, so you're gonna have to know what this says yourself. I think it says, thank you very much, but um, hopefully I didn't put a very bad thing up there. So there we go. Uh, it is, says exactly, thank, thank you very much. So Good. thank you very much, bardzo dziękuję, Woody, uh, for your presentation. That was really awesome, especially given the, uh, given the part of the day we are into. Um, one thing I didn't mention when introducing Wood is that uh, we were trying to get Woody to pull on to other by example a few times already. And, uh, you know, because of the distance and because of the different things, we failed uh, or we didn't succeed, let's call it this way. Uh, so the great thing about current situation is that we can have uh, so many awesome uh, speakers from the US we couldn't have uh, normally when we would meet in person. So I have one question uh, from the audience and really like this question. And uh, it says, um, so, so, so the question is about your, uh, your first job. Uh, and the question is, was it stressful for the first, uh, in the first job to propose an improvement every week? Oh, no. Uh, matter of fact, this is a, I think this is a, a very telling thing, maybe about me, but about my boss. He knew that, that he couldn't invent all the improvements we need alone. So he was challenging everyone in the company to bring good ideas forward. And this, the way he did it with a 12 or 13 year old boy was just simply to say, keep your eyes open if there's something we can do better. And the first thing that I noticed was, because what I was doing is I, I would have a hose and I would drag it around uh, to the different plants that are in little containers and water them. And I noticed the hoses were leaky. Well, that's something we could do better. We could have a hose that doesn't have a leak in it. So I already knew how to fix a hose. I grew up on a little farm. So I just started fixing the hoses. So at the end of the week, when I went into the boss, I said, uh, he said, well, what did you notice? What do we need to fix? And I said, well, uh, the hoses were leaking. So um, I, I started fixing them. I found where you had your tools and stuff. And uh, there was another fellow working there named Bill. He showed me where I could get the supplies I needed. And my boss said, hey, that's great. So keep your eyes open. The next week, what I noticed was why were the hoses leaking? And the hoses were leaking because we were dragging them around over the rocks. They have rocks everywhere that, that are in the, in the plant beds and we're dragging, they're getting worn out too quick. So I made the next suggestion was, um, let's put in some uh, water spigots, you know, a faucet at each flower bed or each planting bed so that we don't have to drag the hoses so much. So this just became my natural pattern. I didn't know the world should be any different. It didn't stress me out, but I will say this. After working there, and I was there more or less for about four or five years, uh, when I was about 18 or 19, I went to work at a fast food restaurant. And uh, it was the nighttime shift, which is when you're cleaning everything. You have to clean all the steel and, and wipe everything down and clean all the machines. And I noticed lots of improvements we could make. So I went to my boss and said, hey, here's something we could do better. He said, shut up and just keep cleaning. That was more stressful <laughs> than giving the freedom to share my ideas and just being told to do what you're told. So I think my first boss understood that if he involves everybody in getting better ideas, the organization will become a learning driven organization. And the second boss didn't understand that. It took me years to understand that first company was just good luck. That was just good luck that I was working in a place where my boss wanted the input of people. So he made it easy for me to, to bring these improvements forward. We never ran out of things to improve. 
I hope that wasn't too long of an answer. Is, is there any more questions? Um, yes, we have a few more questions. Um, I'm just going to comment that the whole story uh, is at your blog, I think, right? So, so this can be I fine. do have that story at my blog or one of my earlier blogs. And um, that's pretty much the true story. My boss was named Lawrence Smith. And uh, I, I, he passed away many years ago. I learned a lot from him. And it took me 60 years of my life to, to learn those lessons internally. It's, it's uh, are now 50 plus years. So uh, yeah, pay attention to those old folks. Sometimes they have some good things to say. <laughs> so I'm going to ask a different question around that topic uh, before we get to the, to the more questions. So um, if you get into the, uh, to the fast food, uh, not as a, not as a you know, line, line uh, uh, employee, but like a manager, so you get into the organization when already people were told not to show the improvements, how you change the organization, how you make the people to thrive in this organization again. So uh, this really is what this talk was about. If I could just tell you what that is, how to do this, I would love to do that. But it's gonna be different at each organization. By the time, uh, so, in 2009, uh, there was a bit of a kind of a recession. And up to that point, I had just been on a job for about six or seven years that I thought uh, I could make a lot of difference there, but I was not able to make much difference. I tried everything I could, but it was a wonderful learning opportunity for me to, to try and see how I can influence people to make things at least a little bit better when I didn't have any power to force that. So um, at the end of that time, I made a decision. I'm no longer gonna to go to work at places where they're not ready to make improvements. I'm gonna make sure when I'm getting interviewed, I'm gonna interview them as well. And I'm gonna make sure they're ready to make improvements. And so the next job I took, we did that. And then the, the, after that, I was on that job for a couple of years and I realized that the challenges weren't big enough for me. And I started looking for bigger challenges. And that's when I got really picky about finding places I could work where we could really make some improvements. That first job was me experimenting with it. And now uh, I was really ready to move on. I wish I could tell you, uh, you probably have had Linda Rising speak at your conference in the past, I'm gonna guess. If you haven't, you'll wanna get her. Um, she's written a couple books. One's called um, Fearless Change. And there she's talking about uh, how do we influence change when we don't have the power to enforce change? So I think it's a pretty good book and there's many others like that. The works of people like Esther Derby um, uh, also address this. It's hard to get these changes. The system is managers who rise up in a system do so because they're willing to go along with the system. That means they've all bought into whatever this system is and uh, you're gonna rock the boat or you know, question the status quo if you try to make changes. I like the bubble idea. That's one I'm sharing now that I think it worked for me definitely a couple times. And I think it's worth giving that some thought. That requires somebody in power above you to provide that bubble or for you yourself to provide that bubble. That person has to, has to interface with the rest of the company to keep that team from being, or that group from being interfered with. I'm happy to take more questions. I, I can, I've got plenty of free time and I know you have your schedule, but if you have more questions. Yeah, we got a few more minutes. So, so just to comment on what you say is basically change the organization or change the organization, right? Yeah, I love that. That's a pretty good saying. Now, sometimes I've had to change the organization because they fired me. And sometimes I've decided to leave, but I really prefer to stick it out and see if I can influence some change. Okay, so I'm moving to the next question, which is uh, managers build complex processes in order to limit the risk, in, in their opinion. Uh, so how to convince them to change their thinking uh, what evidence, using what evidence? Oh, so I, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. If, uh... If you could restate that a little yeah, bit for me. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna read it again. I'm gonna tell you my understanding because that's the question from the audience and then I might be wrong in the understanding. Um, this is right. just a presentation about being wrong on something, right? So the question is that manager build the complex processes in order to limit the risk in their opinion. So, so basically there is a way manager thinks that the 
complexities about uh, you know re reducing the risk. Risk. How do you convince them to change the, that thinking and using what evidence? So how do you convince people that uh, the complex processes, meaning the com I think that is complicated processes uh, uh, that limit the risk, is uh, limiting also the team's creativity? That is my guess. Okay. So first of all, if if what we're doing is in the complex space, and that really means anything de dealing with people but activities like software development or pro uh, product design or whatever. Um, if it's in that space, we cannot use the techniques we would use in the complicated space. But if we don't understand these spaces exist, so the first thing would be help them understand these spaces exist. Well, how, if the manager is above you, that's different than a manager maybe being in a different department or being a peer of yours. So how are you going to convince them? I haven't learned how to convince anybody of anything. Uh, part of what I do in my talks is present some arguments. So what I talked about today, a lot of these things, for example, is just helping them be aware that there is such a difference between complex and complicated. Let's talk about those biscuits for a second. If we're in the complicated space and, and it takes uh, us to really figure this stuff out because every day uh, the temperature in the room changes, the ovens uh, don't act the same every day and so on, we are paying a lot of attention. But if we wanna make it where it's gonna go about down to the clear space, then we need to, to work with our product or whatever it is to make it super easy to do. It's gonna, we're gonna lose some of the qualities, but we're, the quality we're really, really trying to get is to make it easy to do. So, but what if we really want the quality of those delicious croissants? They're flaky and they're really tasty and that's the way I want them to be. Then we still, we gotta be in the complicated space. But what if we want something really new and that's what software development is. If your software development is just doing the same old thing, you are in the complicated space. You're not in the complex space. But just understanding these, so one trick that I used to use many years ago, and this is important um, for me to find allies in the company, somebody else who's ready to think about making things better. So although I don't have much influence on my, my boss, I might find another person at their level who's already thinking this way, and they're trying to understand themselves. If they don't understand the domains, I can help them learn about it, or they don't understand how systems work. I can help them learn about it because they're open to the conversation. Now they can influence across at their level. And so eventually it spreads around. There's no quick and easy solution I have found. And if you found one, please let me know because I'd love to have that. But I haven't seen it yet. I've seen a lot of uh, supposedly perfect systems of people training and and uh, introducing new uh, methodologies and so on. I, I don't see it. I, I've seen them doing it, but I don't see them getting the results that they, they think they're getting or want to be getting. That's part of the confirmation bias. If I learn to be a trainer, let's you know make up an acronym you know in the, in the greatness uh, programming, and, and I wanna be a trainer, I get certified to be a greatness certified programmer and then a greatness certified trainer. I'm just buying into whatever thing they're selling and that's never going to get us anywhere. We're giving up our own agency when we just follow the rules that somebody else has taught us. We need to be questioning things. Find other people in your organization who are open to that and hopefully you can you can influence the overall organization. That's not much help and I'm sorry but um, I really, I really like the answer. So, so I, I'm buying into the the answer. I know. Um, you know, I was hoping you have something, you know, still for us, like a very, very last uh, solution for all the problems with the management. Uh, but we can live with well, this. I can throw out one quick thing. Once I learned that if we focus on what's going well and getting more of that, a lot of the problems and the and the other things that are making it hard for us to be effective fade away. If we learn to watch for the good things and say, how can we get more of that? That's a really powerful thing to do. So I encourage people to try that. It's not that hard to do. You just have to remind yourself every day to look for the things that are going well. If you put it on your schedule, put it on your, your calendar that every day you'll get with your teammates or somebody and say, hey, what went well today? And what can we do to get more of that tomorrow? Then maybe that will help. You just need to spend five minutes 
kind of paying attention to what's going well through the day. At the end of the day, spend five minutes talking about it and thinking how you can get more. That, that's a good thing to do. And, and we end up with the extreme programming doing more of what matters. So yes. uh, yeah, we're going to finish because of the time. And I'm just going to ask, uh, are people going to get your presentation because they love it? And there is another question. Do you have a shorter version for uh, inpatient uh, management? So somewhere, something that people can share with uh, their managers. Uh, you mean like maybe getting a slide deck of this or something like that? Yeah, or... We have a recording as well, but uh, there's a question about do you have a super short version for their managers? So this talk is really something I'm still working on and um, I haven't finalized it too much. Uh, if this recording is going to be available, if this is too long for your managers, definitely think about finding a better place to work. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I would argue that uh, the job of management is to pay attention to stuff like this. And if they can't, um, yeah, I wish you the best.